Hello and welcome to Reservoir Red Dogs, the Nottingham Forest podcast. I'm Matt Ford and as always, joined by Paul McGregor. Hello Paul. How are you doing mate? You good? Very good. I'm very excited. I have to say thank you to everyone for their emails and tweets and texts and everything else about the last episode, the Paul Hart episode. We're still getting loads of emails about the Macca special. Really? That has touched people. <laughs> I knew it would. But the the reception has been fantastic. That's nice. People Do you care you, to man. share them with me? Well, I don't have any right in front of me now, which makes it sound like I made it up. You, you have. I but mean, we've had so many. And people have said to me face to face that that was one of their favourites. It can't be proven, so I don't believe you. <laughs> Paul Hart went down very, very well. Uh, if you would like to email the show, please do. RRD1865 at Outlook.com. Follow us on Twitter at RRD1865. Subscribe to the podcast. It helps other people find it. Share it with your mates and please do review it on iTunes and that helps other Forest fans find it. I'm delighted to say that today's guest is a true Forest legend and someone very, very close to the hearts of the people of Nottingham. He still lives here. He loves the place. He played for Forest for six years, 150 appearances and three goals. It's the one and only Guy Moosey. Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be there. It's so, I, I feel like one of the great things about social media is mm-hmm. you can make friends on there. Yeah. And I feel like I've known you now for at least, I feel <laughs> exactly. like we know each other, but this is the first time we've met. We met. Exactly. And it's really cool that for all the problems of social media, actually, one of the great positives as a fan is that I can get to know Forest players like you, people that I idolised and, and watched, and we can chat and, and talk about Forest and things he like that. He does get overly familiar with Forest players, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> That makes it sound like it's borderline criminal. Well, I bit. mean, I'm just... It's, it's a little bit creepy. It's not <laughs> creepy. I hope I haven't been creepy, Guy. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> um, but you must realise, I mean, I'm not sure what your experience is on there, but you are very well loved by Forest fans on, on um, social media. Yeah, it's, um, it's kind of strange because I've just been natural. So when I want to say something, I would say it. If I'm su- I will always support in the red, so I keep supporting it. And for people, it's kind of, oh, why? It's just like, you know, when you play for this club, then uh, you have to play for the club to realise how it is, to be fair. And then nowadays in a business environment, there is a lot of businessmen going to a club. Having a club which is kind of a familiar club is really, for me, like, really, really important. And it's down to my value, so... We talk about this a lot, don't we? Well, yeah, and it's more interesting, I think, because Forrest have had so few French players, Mm -hmm. and I think you've played with two of them, uh, Adeline Guadior and, and yes. Jamal Abdoun. Yeah. Uh, and the other guy, Mikhail Antoine Courier, I don't think ever played a first no. team game. So really, there's only been three of you and, and yeah. you're all and there. Hamza, Ben Sharif. Ah, yes, of course. And Tony Diag. They oh, okay. were youngsters when I first came here. Yes. Where yeah. was Louis Jean from? Oh, Matthew Louis Jean, of course. Yeah, but he, he, I think he left. Oh, yeah, but he was. Uh, but he wouldn't have been there at the same time. No. Um, so you talk about the, the atmosphere of the club. Compared to all the other clubs that you played for, yeah. is Forrest unique in that sense of it being. Um, yes, um, I have many memories. Um, for example, if we come back to uh, Nigel Duty, um, I remember when I first came at Forest, so young, young lies, 22, uh, first time <laughs> outside the country. And, um, you know, in France, for example, it's rare that you will see the chairman. And when you see the chairman, it's kind of like, you know, bombing the chest up and <laughs> showing that he's got the power, for example. And I remember the first time that I met uh, Nigel Duty, we, it was during the preseason, sometime around July, and I seen a tall guy walking in a car park, and I was like, and I could have seen the other player like, oh, it's, it's the chairman, it's the chairman. I couldn't, I could barely speak English. So I was, like, who is that? He said, oh, he's the one that paid you wage. So he's the chairman. <laughs> I was like, okay, and I could have seen a tall guy walking with a backpack, but alone in a in a car park. So you could have seen the humility of the of the person. And then I remember every single, before every, every season, we used to have like a kind of a party in his, one of his house. He used to invite every people, so from the groundsman, from the people at the reception, really? at the training ground, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember they were asking me, oh, who are you with? And I said, I'm here on my own. And she, I said, my sister is there, but in Manchester. But I was kind of shy, like, oh, no, I cannot bring my sister because it's something kind of private. And the chairman was like, okay, bring your sister. And I was like, but she's got a little kid. He said, okay, bring the kid. Where is your mom? <laughs> I was like, my mom is in France. He said, oh, she wants to come over. I was like, no, that's too much. <laughs> but this is how it was. And then this is how you start to get to know the groundsman, every single people that used to work at Nottingham Forest. And then you start to understand that they have even more power, or if I can say power, but influence as you a player. So we were all in the same level. 
That's why nowadays I can go to the city ground, I see the groundsman, and we're gonna hug each other because this is how we met. And um, I think there is not many clubs that you will see something something like that. Oh man, oh, that is great. that is lovely to hear. I mean, I suppose in a way, we talked to all our guests about Forest mm. and what they knew about the club before they came here and yeah. what their impression was. Growing up in France, had you ever heard of Forest before? That's too qu- <laughs> not really. And then to come back to uh, to the story, so. I remember when I was supposed to sign for Freud, so I first came here and um, my agent at the time told me, oh, there is Nottingham Forest who's interesting, it's a, it's a second division team in, 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 in England. And to be fair, growing up, I never really liked watching football. I liked it playing football. But then I was watching the big games, but not really watching football on TV. So I didn't know that much about Nottingham Forest and um, I had a few interests from Premier League club in France and I wanted to stay in France. And I first came, then I came over, my agent said, okay, come, let's have a look, they want to meet you. So I met um, Colin Cardwood at the time, yeah. that was the manager. I was in a meeting room and they showed me the last game of the season and uh, to show me the atmosphere, etc., etc. And I've seen this first, because in my mind, when we were in France, we were like, oh, English English football is tough, even, even though I was a tough player, but I said, oh, it's tough. So I, we were thinking, Physically okay, tough. Physically tough. <laughs> so I was thinking the lowest you go, then the harder it's become. Yeah. And then the less football you would play, I would say. So I see this first game, and the last game of the season against Yeovil, and what I've seen, Julian Benes tackle. <laughs> not even a, ca- a, a yellow card, not even a wrestle, and then he strike the ball straight after. And I was next to my head, and I, and, and I slap his leg. I was like, <laughs> I shake my hands like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not gonna say yeah. <laughs> And then uh, I was with David Frio at the time, which is the one that... Um, I was at Plymouth with David. Exactly. So he's the one that came to France to, uh, to say that, uh, OK, Nottingham Forest is interesting. I, need to, I want you to come to, uh, to Nottingham to see the city and uh, the training ground, etc., etc. And then to be fair, f- the first time I came, I was like, OK, I feel like not home, but I feel all right. I'm not like, you know, thinking that I'm not going to like this city. So it was OK. Then I've seen... Uh, Obviously, the enthusiasm around the club, like I was playing in France and the big derby was, uh, I was playing in Angers, the big derby was again FC Nantes and we were reaching probably something like 12K a game. <sighs> wow, so nowhere near the no. sort of numbers you get at Forest. And then even the atmosphere wasn't that, like like the atmosphere in England and I come here, I was like third division team winning the last game, 30,000 people. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? <laughs> and then I go to see the training, the training ground and I could have seen the pitch it was like brilliant because we have the best ground man in Nottingham. So the pitch was brilliant. I was like, okay, I can enjoy my football here, passing the ball, etc. And I was like, okay. Then I went back to France and then it was a little bit, you know, in balance in my mind and I'm, I've got my family from Cameroon and then who's living in France and they all know about Nottingham Forest. They say, oh, you don't know Nottingham Forest is a big club. They won Amazing. the Champions League twice, etc., etc." I was like, okay. So yes, you, you may enjoy it because it's a really a huge club. And then I ended up signing it and then enjoying it. Oh man, wow. that's really, a, a, because it's, we've talked to Reedy about coming over from Ireland at mm-hmm. a young age. But I suppose Ireland and England, they have the same language, there's so yeah. much culturally in, in common, despite obviously the, the, the differences. But coming over from France, still at a relatively young age, yeah. did you bring any family and friends with you? No, I, I came on my own, to be Man. fair. So I stayed on my own. And then, you know, sometimes it's like, some people won't appreciate that much because they're born and bred in Nottingham. So for them, it's normal. Yeah. But I've got had a different culture, a different view of the situation. So coming from France, uh, background from Africa, from Cameroon, etc., etc., and coming here, and then it's like recently we um, I posted on Instagram a picture of uh, Jim King who passed away, and for me he was the legend of the football club yeah. of Nottingham. I remember coming here, couldn't speak English. It was around sixty years old, seventy years old, and uh, my mom wanted to come over for the weekend to see the first game, and uh, we were playing against uh, Reading at home and the, the, f- the, the, um, the flight to come from Paris to, to East Milan Airport was coming at five in the morning and then oh, you are going from African culture, we respect people holding on us, etc, etc. And then Jim King was saying, oh, come on, Nogi, you have a game, you have to be focused on the game. And he said to me, uh, what time your mom arrived? And I was like, kind of ashamed. Yes, you arrived at five, but you weren't going to pick up my mom at five. You weren't going to wake up at four to go to the airport and pick up my mom at five. 
He was like, no, 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 no. Yes, I, have to, I, I, I will do that. Don't worry. I was like, no, 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 no. And he fight against me to say, stay focused on this game against Reading. And he went to pick up my money on the morning. Wow. The Reading game, is that the one where you catch, is it Sanko? So, yeah. Right in the face. Have you seen it? <laughs> I've seen it. Oh, my. <clears throat> and even the commentator says, it's like he's been hit by a heavyweight boxer. Like, the ball <laughs> hits him straight in the face. And then you sort of see his eyes and then his legs go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that must be the hardest, amongst the hardest... Times anyone's ever hit a football. <laughs> this from a Stuart Pearce fan. Yeah, yeah. And did your mum say, flipping heck, Lee? Uh, she French. didn't say anything, but she may think about that, yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So you first come to Nottingham, and, and you, you can't speak English that well when you first come here. Mm-hmm. Could you understand the Nottingham accent? Can you now? That's interesting, because I was with um, Colin Cadu, Scottish yeah. manager, yeah. at that probably scouts in the teams, people from yeah. Liverpool, people from Newcastle, people from Ireland, Welsh. And I just start learning English with them. So for me, I didn't even understand that they were having an accent. I was just thinking that I need to learn English. So it just with time, maybe it's three years later, I understand, ah, oh, okay, this is an accent from Scotland. This is an accent yeah. from Ireland. But just put me, put you in my shoes, knowing that you have to understand Colin Cardo with <laughs> Scottish accent. <laughs> While the English players were saying that, oh, we can't even understand him. I was like, how could I understand him then? Can you imagine picking up Scouse words? <laughs> <laughs> Scouse words, <laughs> Geordie words, Scottish yeah. words, all Irish. thrown in with a, you know, broken French accent. That and then, and then the locals are calling you duck. Have you, have you been called that yet? All right, no, duck. No, they call me uh, snails. <laughs> Did <laughs> French, they? Yeah, French Is that the frog. nickname? No, French frog. No way. Yeah. To your face. At the beginning. At the beginning. No, because they say, the, like, in French, people eat frogs' legs. That's right. Et et <laughs> snails. So that's why they used to call me. But in a nice uh, way, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they call Matt? Ginsters. Ginsters. They call me Ginsters, yeah. <laughs> what, what is it? That we're called uh, Le Rust Beef, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's the same. It's just about what we eat, isn't it? So hopefully it's not too jingoistic. <laughs> so, you, um, so you come to Forest. And just in terms of being a, a, you know, a, a young Frenchman, yeah. starting not just at, at Forest, but in English football... Mm-hmm. You're obviously trying to pick up the language from all your teammates. Mm-hmm. Do you have to go and have English lessons somewhere else as well? With Jim King. So I was oh, supposed really? to Yeah, yeah, I was supposed Jim King used to, you know, to teach us a little bit of French because he knew a little bit of French and then help us to uh to learn English and then he used to help like you can talk with Ben Osborne and all the single people who's been going through the academy, they all know about Jim King and uh and Hello King, uh, his wife. And uh, yes, he used to help Everybody at the club. That's amazing. That's so yeah. good to know that that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of your most famous Forest moments was your goal against Barnsley <laughs> in 2009. And, and not necessarily just the goal, it's a great finish, but it's in added on time. It's the winner. <laughs> you then get a second yellow for yeah, celebrating yeah, with yeah. the crowd and immediately get sent <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, when you know a goal scorer, you know, you, you lose your mind. So <laughs> I was like, what's going on? I scored. <laughs> So <laughs> in the crowd. I couldn't wait to score, to be fair, at the City ground as well. So, yes, we were, I think, in four games in a row, for winning a road, and um, and it was the 90th minute, nil nil, and then I scored the winner. But then I got sent off. And the, I remember <laughs> the... I didn't even know about that rules. And then, you know, the, the referee came to me and said, like, I'm sorry. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, yes, I'm sorry, but I have to. What do you mean? Say so, yes, uh, you don't, you can't, you can't jump in the crowd. But because in France we're not that close to the crowd, there is a barrier between ah. potentially between the, the fans and the, and and, the, and you know and the players. So for me, I didn't understand that you're not allowed to jump around and then celebrate with the fans. So it just came naturally. So I jumped, jumped out there, celebrated with them, and I came back. I just told me, yeah, I'm sorry. I was like, what are you talking about? I said, yes, that's the rule. You cannot go there. And then I didn't even realize that I, I, was, I had a booking before that. So he gave me the second booking. Oh, and I was man. off. It's a rubbish rule, isn't it? But then walking out, walking past Billy Davids, looking at me, I was like, <laughs> if we don't win this game, <laughs> yeah. I'm in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, it was fine. It worked out fine. Billy Davids, obviously, uh, <coughs> you played under him twice at Forest. He was, yes. you, you were there under both of his spells. There's a great documentary that um, was made for the BBC, East mm-hmm. Midlands, where they follow him mm-hmm. inside the club at home yeah. to his DVD suite and all mm-hmm. stuff like this. And one of my abiding memories of it is him giving a team talk, at, I think, where the academy is on a big screen. Mm-hmm. And 
From the footage I've seen, I don't think Adeline Guadiora can understand a word that Billy Davis is saying. I, can, I don't think half the squad can understand a word he's saying. I haven't seen that for years. It's really yeah. funny. Yeah, I should watch that again. Because what he does, what he does one of those things that people do where, you know, they, you know it's impressive if you remember someone's name, mm -hmm. but it's not impressive if you overuse it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've got Natalie Jackson there from Eastman and Stay, but it's just because it, Natalie, as we see Natalie, yeah. I caught the DVD, we, we, we edit it here, Natalie. And what I'm going to show you, Natalie, is the big screen I've got, Natalie. And Natalie, I don't know what you think about this, Natalie, but I'm going to show it to the players now, Natalie. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's just like he's saying her name so often. It's like he's trying not to forget it. But there's a bit name where he's, Yeah, but you see, yeah. like, there's Raddy Majewski, there's a few others that he cuts to, and they can just about understand him. But poor old Adeline Guadillo is just like, I can't understand the word of it. Like, did, was Billy Davis a hard man to understand? Um, not really. I think, like, I got used by Conincado, would I yeah, say. Yeah, baptism so. of fire, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Straight so, away. No, it wasn't that hard to understand. But yes, he was a, he was a really one of the best managers. I wish he was one of the top mentors. I think you have to play under him to realise how good he was as a, as a mentor. And then... I think nowadays in football is not is yes it's about tactic and technique, but then it's about how you're gonna fire up the, your player and make sure that your player are behind you. And if they are not behind you, you build up a team. And I can explain a few example of the way the way that what you used to do. For example, let's say to build to build up um, a team spirit. I remember um, I remember him saying that so he was really strict. So he was coming. We are all young, youngest quad in the championship. And um, and basically say to us, so he was like kind of a teacher for us, so we were listening to him, so he know that he had a voice, etc. And uh, he said to us, um, when someone scored, I want every single player up to the to the goalkeeper to be all together. We didn't get at the beginning, but then it was the, the beginning of the season, so we wasn't that close between each other. But then when you play football, the biggest joy is to win games yeah. and then when you score goals. So he knew by doing that, because he put a fine behind that, so we, we would have get a fine if he wouldn't do any. Wow. So at the beginning, we used to do it like, because he said to do it, but then you, when you score a goal, you can't fake it. Yes. So you're happy. So I start to jump on Paul McKenna. <laughs> I try to jump on Paul Anderson. And then second, suddenly that like, the game's finished and you need, you're in the dressing room with them and they're like, oh, that was a good goal. And then you start to become friends. So you have little, he had little, Things like this, and I'm like, when I look back, I was like, nah, he's, he's very good. So he was a good motivator, oh, man manager, oh, a, a good psychologist. The best. We he, just used to get a grand behind the bar at Sam <laughs> Fares. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. What, what was the social like life like at Forest when you were there? Would you all go out and drink and, and eat together? Yes. And that's why he created. So basically, I remember we were off every Wednesday, and uh, probably during this season, 10 players out of the team we used to train on a Tuesday early, knowing that we off Wednesday, all going to London by train, Great. having a meal together in a restaurant, and then going out probably, and then staying all together in the same hotel, having a laugh, and come back all together on a Wednesday to Nottingham. Yeah, good. That's a great yeah. idea, because then you're not seen out in Nottingham. Yeah. And you've so, got the whole of London to play with. Exactly, but for, for us, it's like, you're a public figure, you cannot do anything really in Nottingham and so even true. though sometime I remember a story when um, German Jenas went out we went for a meeting in Uters he haven't done anything and then people came to him and make trouble and the next yes. minute yes the first player were there etc etc it's a big trouble now we used to go in London bear in mind nobody knows us mm. but then we could have been together and having a real laugh because nobody gonna see us and judge us but he created a, um, like a, a team spirit and uh, I think that's why we've been really, really successful. That's such a good point. So because you say there was a grand behind the bar at Sam Fays, but would you ever need to get out of Nottingham? Did you ever think, actually, we're better off going down to London for a night? Yeah. Different times, mate. <laughs> 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 Didn't really care. <laughs> it was, you know, it's just, um, it was like, like my old man when I was a kid, you know, just do what you want. Just don't bring the police to the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is that, do you think, because you were... Forest were in the Premier League then, so it was maybe different. It was sort of more socially acceptable because we were riding a little bit higher. Or was it just like the, the culture around football and, and society at the time was that people were just more okay with footballers out? I mean, I think it's a bit of everything. I mean, I, I remember one Christmas do where 
the Loaded, you know Loaded magazine? Yeah. So they did a show at Nottingham Rock City. Me and Scott Gemmell went on stage. That we, we took the rider on stage with the fruits. So we were launching, there was a big food fight. We were on there with Bez and Joe Guest and wow. Kathy Lloyd. It was, it, yeah, it was absolutely crazy. But all day, I mean, we'd been out doing like, a, you know, the golf game with drinking. Yes. In Nottingham, mm-hmm. middle, you know, fans coming up, joining in, and we're up leathered and all mm-hmm. kinds of kicking off. It's just a different time. There's yeah. no phones or anything. Yeah, exactly. So who was in the room saw it. So it's word of mouth unless there's a journalist there. Mm-hmm. So at Rock City, 2,000 people saw me and Scott throwing all kinds of stuff, absolutely leathered. I think, I had my, I think I'd done my knee by then. So I had this big brace on. <laughs> just whoever's in the room saw it. And that was Wow. That. If you were in the room, email us, rrd1865 <laughs> at outlook.com. We'd love to do tweet us I as well. I think somebody has mentioned before, because Scott was getting loads of stick. Because Scott wasn't that popular, to be fair. Was he? That was he, strange, all that. Well, all, every player that's popular. ever played with him says that he was, that he was arguably me. the best player they've played with. But yeah. there was some weird thing about fans Amongst a minority really. of fans, like... The majority of fans, I think, right? It was, yeah, it was, it was really strange. He was getting some stick, so I, I'd, I'd stuck up for him and started, you know, telling them he's got a Porsche and a, a this, that, and the other, yeah. and we, we, we had it. But, uh, yeah, it was good fun. <laughs> different times, different, different times. times different times, different times. Exactly. So one of the things that Billy Davis would do would, would, would make DVDs, and this was, like, this was his trademark, that he had an yeah. editing suite up at his home in Glasgow. Mm-hmm. In terms of those DVDs, would, would he just make one DVD that you would all watch, or would he make individual videos for each player? Um, mm, no, he was kind of making DVDs and videos on the team that we're going to play against. Right. But then he was able sometimes to find it because he, was, he used to understand that sometimes it was boring for us to always uh, focus on the other team. And I remember one of the game, it was an important, in, important game and we knew like, okay, the whole week we've been watching DVDs and, and, and videos on other teams. And then right before the game, we, used, we were supposed to have like a 10 minute video on, on another team. And then instead of doing that, he came with a highlight of 10 minutes of each player wow Better. so like a dvd with the music and everything and you know <laughs> he edited it to music yeah he did like a nice music you know to try to you know find oh like, that is just brilliant like a oh. motivation motivation <laughs> kind of <laughs> exactly you know something like that nice. <laughs> and do you think had he stayed he'd have got for his promoted eventually that's a good question i think like you always know that you would expect to be at the top six with billy david if you let him do what he wants to do Obviously, sometimes there is like, you know, argument with the board, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to go into that. Yeah. But in terms of manager, you know that you're going to get something with him. When he, signed, when he signed for the club, we almost got really get what my first season at, uh, at Nottingham Forest. So we, we stayed in a championship, I think. That's when you got injured. Was that- yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So then we stayed, I think, two, two games before the end of the season. This is how we saved us with uh, the, 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 game, the goal of Dexter Blackstock. And then... Um, the next season, what he done, he said, okay, I'm going to sign the player that were there on loan, which is um, Lee Camp, Joe Lynch, Paul Anderson, Dexter Blackstock. I can't remember if, no, Randy wasn't there yet. And then from that, he said, okay, instead of having you on loan, I want you to be committed to the club. Because now, you're just coming, you're just not coming here thinking that, okay, the, the future of the club is just, their future, me, I just come here to play games because mm. your future, the future of the club is your future. So you know that he would have player committed. And then we were the younger squad in the championship. And then the, I remember we were in Portugal for preseason. We had like probably two or three meeting a day. So we were like in a classroom, like, like listen, at, listen to him. And then he used to like talk to us, talk to us, talk to us. And then he used to finish every single meeting. So he used to come and say, why are we going to do that? He finished by why, and he leave a big blank for like five seconds. And he said, because we're going to win a league with a small voice like this. Because I want you to save your family. Because I want you to have that amount, that amount of money a week to be able to save your family. Every single time. The first meeting, we came out of the meeting, and said, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> Younger squad in the championship, almost get with the gate, and you're talking about getting promoted while we have Newcastle, West Bromwich, Birmingham, etc., etc. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Next day, same thing. And you can see in his eyes that he's convinced. And then you're like, okay, today, we're talking about maybe what, six years, seven years later, if I go and speak with uh, Wes Morgan, 
Chris Gunter, Gareth McClary, and I come to them and I say, why? They're going to say, because we're going to win a league. <laughs> but you, we're laughing, but when you're talking about the power in the subconscious and then your mental strength, he put that in our mind that even if you don't want to believe it, your subconscious believe it. Wow. So then Lovian. that season, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. And then that season, we ended up third in the league, just below, uh, just after Newcastle and, and West Bromwich. Oh, and we were top for a yeah. while as well. Like, we we should have gone up automatically that year. I remember that game at West Brom away when Raddy Mowski scores that incredible goal. Exactly. I thought we, that night, I remember watching that in a pub in London, just thinking we are definitely going up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Blackpool finished sixth. Exactly. And, and then the rest of it. Well, and you didn't play in the Blackpool games. McKenna played instead. Yeah, I wasn't. I got in just, just right, I think. I think it was the week of the first leg. And then, then the second leg I could have played, but then because I haven't played the first leg and nah. he, want, he just wanted to keep the same team. But yeah. Oh my God, we're going to be crying now. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to make you cry. I don't want to make you cry. But was that, I mean, that's the closest thing to a cup final, I suppose. You know, yeah, you yeah, one yeah. game away from Wembley. If, if you don't play in games like that, it, oh, that must be hard to take. Yeah, it was really, really hard to take, especially the second leg, because I was talking with him and then he was expecting me to play and the last minute I have he said oh I changed my mind I have to play this guy which I accept, accepted but I wasn't even in the bench so you know when you've been like um, one of the, the the main player of the team and then you've seen that the most important game and then you feel the atmosphere with the fan and everybody expecting that and then you want to help them to achieve this and then you cannot you cannot make it and oh, it's so frustrating that second leg I mean, the first leg when Chris Cohen scores, that incredible, yeah. that's one of my favourite ever goals. Mm-hmm. At that point, I just thought, this is it. We're yeah. definitely, I mean, there have been so many periods in yeah. Forest history. But did, <laughs> did the squad believe that they were going to get promoted that season? You know, I think it's all about mental. I really believe in mental. And, um, you know, when you realise, for us, it was a huge frustration not getting into the top two. Mm. Because, as you said, when we beat uh, West Brom away, for us, it was, okay, we've done it now. Now we have to, we're second in the league. We have to just carry on. Yeah. And then after, we're struggling to get point away from home. And then basically, it's like a month, a month and a half before the, the, the playoff, you already know that the fourth place, the, the, the fourth team cannot catch us. And then you cannot catch as well the second place. So we're just there and like, mm. just overthinking, oh, uh, yes. this game over there, we should have won it. We would have been like second in the league, this one as well, and this one as well. So it's really tough to get, but then you have to stay focused. But then you the can't ma- think like that. Can yeah, you? but it's, it's hard. And then you have to, you, sometimes you go to away games and there is, <coughs> there is when, when you know that you weren't going to get second and then you, you are, you're going to finish third, doesn't matter if you lose every single game. How do we find this motivation? Yes. Then you start thinking, okay, I don't want to play this game and get injured because I need to be ready for, the, for these playoffs. Yeah. But then if you don't play those games, you, will, you won't be fit. And then in the same time, you, you, we start losing games. And then you think, oh, it's, it's not important. But yes, it's important. If you lose games before big games, then you need to keep this one winning mentality. So then you have Blackpool, never been in a playoff, and then jumped into the playoff the last yeah. day of the... Finish of the, it. Yeah. yeah. God. And then you have us. Well, they've got the momentum then, haven't they? Exactly. So we have us thinking, no, we have to, we're supposed to get in the second place. What are we doing there? Now we have one more month because it's tough going all, through all the season like that, thinking that I can get promoted and then you have to go through the playoff again. Well, you have Blackpool just coming in the last day and they're like, okay, for us, it's all like, all happiness. We just have to play this game and then it's all bonus. Yeah. It's so interesting that that psychology of finishing third and knowing you're going to finish third. Yeah. Like, was there ever a period in your time at Forest where, where you, or any time in your playing career, where you're in a similar situation where you've you've kind of done okay and you know you're going to finish in a particular position and then it's hard to motivate yourself? No, it's it's more when I when I was at Forest, we, there was, we were always challenging for something. Yes. Or it's towards the end of Clough and it was down that the, the bottom end. I think I think with the second half of my career, kind of at Plymouth and Northampton, just being mid-table, it's, it, you know, you're motivated individually mm-hmm. to to play your best, mm-hmm. but possibly to get a move, exactly. you know, and climb and climb, climb back up. But, uh, yeah, I mean, when you're, you know, when you're 13th, 12th, 11th in the league, quarter of the season to go, mm-hmm. you're not going to get in the playoffs. You're not going to get... So I found myself kind of four years of sat in this mm-hmm. blob of football. It was quite quite dull. 
You said something interesting before, not on this show, but but to me... I've never said anything interesting on this show. You say, oh, that is not true, and the email's prove it. The email's that I can't specifically it's recall. Fine. Um, but, um, about, as a player finding motivation, that having younger players at the club, potentially to replace you, keeps you on your toes. And you think you did that for Brian Roy in a way? Yeah, I mean, Brian Roy and Kev Campbell, you know, me and Bobby were on the touchlines as young lads, desperate to get on and, and get them out of the team. Two fantastic Premier League centre-forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing against Kev, Brian Roy, arguably one of the best ones Forrest have ever had. Yes. And when they would come off the pitch and we would come on, you know, and we're like this, pent up, this is, this is everything we've ever worked towards. Mm -hmm. You could see them, you know, they've, they've been ploughing through the game, it's not working for them. And then two young lads come on, possibly get a goal. Everyone lifts. And then I had it at the other end when I was at Northampton, plodding in that mid zone. There was a young kid called, um, I think he was Garnet and Derek Asamoah. Oh. He, but he played until he Rings was like bell, 40 odd. Anyway, but I, <laughs> I only had to kind of have a bad touch even within the first 10 minutes. And everyone was like, Asamoah. Ah, oh, so no. It's, it's <laughs> no. It's young kids no, on the no, touch no, lines yeah, like that. Yeah, so yeah. you just know it. You, yeah. just, you feel You do mm. feel it. Mm. Actually, age is an interesting thing because I think you're the first guest we've had on, Guy, that is mm -hmm. younger than us. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were born in 1985. Yeah. So you're the youngest guest we've had on. And we had a number of emails. Steve Coates was the first one to ask this. Can you ask Guy why he doesn't play anymore? He's still relatively young. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, I don't want to uh, talk too much about football, but <laughs> I really love football, for real. And then for me, playing at the city ground, or nowadays I play with my friends. Sometimes I'm in forest field training a few kids and then, and then use them really to be able to play football. I am enjoy it that much. I love playing football. And then I think sometimes nowadays the football has become too much business. And growing up uh, playing football, for me it was kind of an escape of, of everything on the society that you can say that if you're good in a field, doesn't matter you're going to play. But now there is so much things going on. There's a freedom business. to it. Exactly. It? Yeah. And now we have to understand that sometime in transfer, you have to have a certain age because we're going to sell in after that or stuff like this. And the money wasn't even something that re at some point really motivated me. So I'm like, when I was talking with teams, for example, they were first thing, oh, uh, we cannot uh, pay you that much or, or this or that. And I'm like, Hold on a minute, talk to me about football, tactics, how do I, the way you want to play first before you talk about the money. So things start to change and then I'm like, well, you know, I wasn't, I was playing with my friend, I can see that I can keep fit, try it too. <laughs> <laughs> and then enjoy playing football and then I'll jump into another businesses as well that took me a lot of time since the last two years. So I was like, anyway, the football is going to end at some point, but I will carry on playing for the joy of it. So I just like decided to stop. In this other business, we, we should mention it, it, it. Quite an interesting thing that you've invented, which is, if I get if I'm right, a yeah. strap that goes around the leg that mm -hmm. reduces blood flow to the muscles and therefore yeah. mimics heavy weightlifting without mm -hmm. the need for yeah. for weight. This called, this method called blood flow restriction training. So we restrain the blood flow, and then from that you move, and then just being between ten to thirty percent of your maximum reps, so very light load or body weight, you will be able to reproduce a high intensity training. Wow. with a quicker time and then because is there is similar to kind of I'm thinking of the science of it is it kind of similar to altitude training you starve yourself exactly you know when you exactly and then then you have a response from your body yeah. so it's something but more local okay. okay and then from that there is thousands and thousands of studies on it that you know show that it really works but then there is no equipment secured and optimized to be able to to work on it so we surround ourselves with like uh, with um, an hospital in France, some professor, engineer, scientist, and an injury school to be able to create a device that will be able to respond to the physiological aspect of the human body to recreate this training. And then, so there is a big uh, so that can help many people in the football. Then I can, but because football can, help, it's my first you know market because I've been football player and I can help football players. But then the big aim is to be able to help every single person. A lot of people, again, um, talked about this, uh, and, and Jack McCormick perhaps puts it best. He said, I've wondered for many years, did Guy always know that we were chanting moose, or did he originally think that people were booing him? At first, I didn't even know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was thinking I'd do something good, a good pass or a good tackle. And I said, boo, I said, what happened? Stay focused, stay focused. Then, then people told me, no, don't mind it. He's like, they're just saying moves. I was like, ah, okay, no problem. But um, yeah, sometimes I don't really get too much focus on what's going on in the crowd. So I didn't really get it. But it's true that some of my teammates came in a change room and said, no, they're not booing you, they're saying moose. And then now I start to focus a little bit more on what's going on when I had the ball mm. and understand, you know, all those noise. Mm. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you realize it's the same when positive. you go and see Bruce Springsteen. Bruce. Yeah, Bruce. <laughs> I remember, it was it Muta who played for Chelsea? And the Chelsea fans would always go, Muta, or whatever it was, like a similar sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And the commentators thought it was getting booed. Yeah. Yeah. They were just chanting his name. But um, he also asks, uh, please ask him about his first game against Derby where he wiped out at least a couple of their players in the first few seconds. <laughs> I think the footage of that is on YouTube as well. Yeah, yeah, Were you yeah. particularly pumped up for that? Yeah, it was good games. And I think it was one of the, the best derbies with Billy Davids and... Uh, oh, I can't remember his name. The manager of uh, of Burton Albion. Was it the City Nigel. Ground? Nigel, yeah. Nigel Clough, yeah. yeah. Nigel Clough, yeah. Was it City Ground or there? That was at Derby. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but at the time, to be fair, it's like, yes, it was a derby and then we wanted to win this game. But derby is always special. But at the time, I think we were second in the league. I think it's the season that we lost against Swansea. And to be honest, even though, though it was Derby County, we used to be on a run that doesn't matter who's facing us, we're going to kill them. Amazing. <laughs> so, yes, we started this game and then we were like, Billy Davis knew the the right words to be able to, you know, to to put the fire inside us and then we knew that we're going to win this game, doesn't matter what. So And then we were in a run, as I said, that derby came in the right timing for us because it doesn't matter if it was even Manchester United, it's easy to say that, but we didn't care. We just, we were so hungry and wanted to win every single game. So, yeah, that was a good start. <laughs> but you can sense that. I remember those seasons yeah. so clearly. There was such a belief and an energy around the side. And then, as you say, that's the season that we got to the playoffs against Swansea. Yeah. And history repeats itself to some extent and we don't get to the playoff final. Mm-hmm. Um, that Swansea, I've got a mate of mine, um, Ellis James, who's a Welsh comic who is a Swansea fan. And me and him travelled up for that game and he said... Yeah. Because they had a man sent off really early in, yeah. the, in, the, in the first leg. Mm-hmm. And he said it was the loudest sound he'd ever heard in a football ground was the noise the Forest fans made when that bloke had... Yeah. Been, he said it was the most intimidating... So it was like a bomb had gone off. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I thought, well, this is it. Yeah. And then it was just one of the most frustrating games <laughs> I've ever watched. Let's not dwell so much on not going up that season. But in that summer, yeah. Everton, West Brom, Stoke, yeah. uh, many others were after you. Yeah. Were you tempted to leave? And, and what kept you at Forest? Um, yes, to be fair, um, you know, I want you, as I say, we all look for improvement. And for me, it was, we stay footballer, we want, we competitor. So I was, if I leave the club, I should be a Premier, for a Premier League club. But I say to myself, there is no way I will leave the club to go to another championship club. So I have different interests from Premier League clubs and then for business, football business, so different things may not happen or maybe my choice or whatever. But then I remember I've got different offers from championship club and then for more money with sun and fee. And, uh, but I was like, there is no point for me to leave Paris because I'm good here. And then we're in a club that we wish the playoff twice in a row. And then I think the message from the board was we take Steve McLaren and then the aim is to finish in the top two. So we were building up on a, in a good momentum, becoming a, a good team, a good championship team that always reaching for the playoff. We have the demand from the club via the history of the club and then from the player to be the best and get to the, to the Premier League. As I said, we have a group of players. We are like a bunch of, of friends. Like up to today, we have a, a WhatsApp group that we talk to each other again. And I was like, if I want to get promoted, it has to be with this team, with this club. Everybody welcome me, etc., etc. What's the point to go to another championship club? And how did Steve McLaren compare to Billy Davis as a manager? I think that was the that was the opposite, I would say. So I think Steve McLaren used to deal with top top players. So then when we're talking about top top players, as you said, they know how to deal with themselves to be to do every single detail to be the best. With Billy Davis, we didn't have, we didn't have choice. If he would have seen that you don't you're not doing something right he would have tell you while Steve McLaren would expect us to behave like top 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 athlete 
And then I think we gain as well to to caution thinking that, oh, we're Nottingham Forest football club. We've been twice in the playoff. Everybody talking about us. And then probably we wouldn't make any effort and then we would win games. But then when you you reach that type of success for two seasons and then you're Nottingham Forest football club, then every single team that you're going to play against, they will expect you yes. to be the best. But then it's like you're the top, the top club. So you have to show them. And then people were coming thinking, okay, it's Nottingham Forest, so... So we're the outsider. So then it's easy for us to go there and play. So you've gone from a really driven mentality of a, of a manager. Yeah. Really focused. Oh. And I can, you know, I can see it when you talk about yeah. him, you know, you, you're like this, you're back there again, to almost arrogant. Mm-hmm. And as a team, did you feel there was an arrogance to it? You're saying we were Nottingham Forest. Yeah. And did, did that slacken to some degree? I don't think we were that arrogant. But then unconsciously, I think we behave like this. Yeah. By staying humble still. But for example, I knew with Tim McLaren that I would have played possibly week in, week out because of the past years that I've been doing at Nottingham Forest, etc. But for example, the season when we lost against Swansea, which is probably my best season at Nottingham Forest, every single game I was under pressure thinking if I lose a touch, uh, I would come out. Yeah. And then this, when you play with this, then it's different. So when I played with Tim McLaren, I knew it, I needed to find this, but I had it in me, but it was different. And then some of the youngsters that, you, that, that were coming, you didn't have the pressure no more about someone in your back, so then probably you gain more lazy. Maybe you used to, have, with Billy Davis, we knew that, I knew that I need to get in top of my game, in top of my fitness, because I had Paul McKenna, or in Paul playing in center midfielder, Chris Cohen, Radim Majewski, so good players. So I was like, if I'm not playing well, I won't be in a starting 11. So then even that, I used to go to David Ludd and run a lot and do a lot more. But then probably I think, because even myself, I think probably not, not this season, but the season after I start to do a little bit less. And then, yes, I think sometimes... It comes off the accelerator, yeah, doesn't it? Exactly. I think sometimes it's like you need to have someone behind you to push you and say, listen, hey, so it wasn't arrogance, it was just that the intensity was hard to replicate from exactly. that competition. Exactly. Um, Michael Wright get, got in touch over email. He said, Ree Moose coming into the podcast. Whenever his name comes up, I'm taunted by a Pies supporting mate, a, a Notts County fan, about once claiming that Guy was the next Patrick Vieira after a pre-season <laughs> game against Everton. Uh, he says uh, there's barely any moral high ground for a Pies fan over the Reds, but I wondered if Guy feels that his time at the City Ground was a success and if he has any funny stories about Billy Davies. Oh. You're putting me on the spot there. Okay, okay. So now I, I enjoy my time here and I'm, you know, I think everything is uh, in life uh, comes for a reason. So I'm so delighted to, that I've, I've been part of the club and uh, you see I've, I set up a different businesses now and it is regarding to the club, so... No, I'm happy about that. And uh, to the comparison with uh, Patrick Via, I'm pleased, but uh, I grew up and always wanted to be Guy Moussi. So I want to be recognised <laughs> yes. as Guy Moussi. Good man. Yes, Patrick good man. Patrick Vieira yeah, exactly. was the last Guy Moussi. <laughs> it should be that way around. Um, I, I mean, Billy Davis, there was something that Billy Davis did that used to really make me laugh at his press conferences. Mm-hmm. He would treat his press conferences like he was being interviewed under police caution. I remember watching one <laughs> live on YouTube where people were going, uh, Billy, are you going to sign anyone in the transfer window? I'll see you with respect to that. No mm. comment. <laughs> I'll just see that. Chucky Natalie. That's what I'll see to that. Natalie, there's no comment. And they go, uh, is it true that uh, you know such and such one's like, I'll just see you with respect to that question. No comment. Mm. Okay, I will move on from that question. <laughs> no, he said no comment to that 10 different questions. He seemed like uh, quite a naturally funny bloke. I mean, was he a good laugh? Yeah, it was like, it's totally different from when people seen on TV or on press conferences. When you know him and then when you believe that the player were his family, he's just one of the nicest guy ever. And uh, you knew that he tried to give you the, to make things that for you to become the best that you can be. If I talk, for example, with Gareth McClary, he had a tough time with, B- with Billy David. He wasn't playing that well, even that much, I would say, even though sometimes he was supposed to play. But then if you talk with Gareth today, you say, yes, ah, Billy David, oh, yes, but he's one of the best coaches that I had because you need to know that in life, you're not just learning when everything is positive. You're, yes. You learn more when things are going wrong. 
And I think that push him to become a better player, to understand, oh, I'm supposed to play, but why I'm not playing? So then you make everything to be able to play and you're still not playing. So then you're going to reach that one or two percent more that you didn't think that you should have done to be able to play. But then you become a better player. I had something similar when I went to, I went on loan to uh, Preston under mm-hmm. David Moyes when they were pushing for the title. Yeah. And um, I thought, you know, I'm from Forest. He mm-hmm. sat me down and said, you know, you're a fantastic player. They want to bring this in. We're looking to bring the best. We're going for the push. Mm-hmm. And he, he essentially brought me in for cover. Yeah. So I go there with a little bit of that thing you spoke about. Mm-hmm. Not, maybe not so much arrogance, but yeah. I'm coming from Nottingham Forest mm-hmm. and Premier League club and I'm going to the first division and and I sat there and I sat on the bench for two months mm-hmm. watching people like Macca McKenna mm-hmm. and um, Johnny Macken, Sean Gregan um, I mean they had a fantastic side mm-hmm. and I was watching hungry players at it yeah. and I had I had two months of learning there mm-hmm. and he, he, had, he had me on the training ground after training improving me and improving mm-hmm. me day in and day out and that was kind of my payment yeah. for coming to the club as backup. I used to have get one-on-ones with David Moyes for like two months. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, I was taught a lesson when I went to that club yeah. on the level of intensity that should be going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see that. And, and, I, and I was quite depressed with that. You know, I was, I was upset. I thought, oh, and I was down. It was a, it was a bad time in my yeah. career. But I learned an awful lot yeah, in those exactly. two months, just watching him, watching the side, watching how they behave in a dressing room. Mm-hmm. I'd never seen a dressing room like that, yeah. where everyone was really football orientated, it, yeah. and it wasn't just le- le- you know relaxed mm-hmm. and at Forest and just play football. These guys were like you described. You were with Billy Davis, really at it, yeah. you know, right on their game. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I learned a lot in those two months. Uh, let's end. I mean, th- this has flown by. Let's end on uh, on some quick positives. What we always do, Guy, is, yeah. is ask our guests the sort of questions they used to get asked by football magazines in the past. So I'm not sure if you were ever asked these sort of questions. Um, what's your favourite film? Favourite film? Uh, Man on Fire, possibly. Oh, excellent. Denzel yeah. Washington. Yeah. Favourite food? Favourite food? Um, hmm. Probably the name is Chebuyap. It's a Senegalese food, African Senegalese food. It's based on rice, uh, lamb. All of that. Nice sauce. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your biggest fear? My biggest fear? Complacement. Complacent? Yeah, complacency. complacency. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh, that's a great mm-hmm. answer. Favourite musical artist? Oh, it depends. I can't say it's difficult because it depends on my mood. So, it depends on what I'm doing, if I'm in the gym or if I'm relaxed at home or... Okay, so um, what would you listen to today, for instance? Um, today, because I got a long drive to Paris today, <laughs> so I have to put something kind of motivation. Sometimes I, li- I listen a lot of like um, motivation speak. Okay, Tony yeah. Robbins type stuff. Yeah, oh, there is many, many ones, different ones. Brian yeah. Clough. Yes, he's inspiring. <laughs> That's inspiring. Winston Churchill. As well, there is uh, there is one calling Ink Johnson. Yes, right. some America, Americans ones. Well, that's good. That's a good yeah. tip for people if they're in need of uh, motivation. And then just some quick ones: um, Cronenberg or Carling? <laughs> that's a dreadful choice. <laughs> oh. I'm trying to think of the most French lager and the most English lager, uh, or maybe neither. Neither. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. <laughs> Paris or Nottingham? <laughs> Ah, that's a tough one, huh? Oh, dear. How can you do that to me? <laughs> Come on, even I'd uh, go Paris. Uh, no, Nottingham is good, you know. No, no, it's good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Paris ain't bad. Nottingham, because I live in Nottingham now. Yes, okay, we okay. knew it. We knew it deep down, the greatest <laughs> city in the world. Guy, it has been a pleasure. Um, I mean, this has just been such a wonderful experience. Thank I think you. one of the most philosophical people I've ever met. Uh, it's been... Um, um, hang on. After Paul McGregor. <laughs> I was going to ask you interrupting me. My <laughs> word. <laughs> sensitive. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so Cheers, much for listening. Nice one, yeah. And uh, do email the show, rrd1865 at outlook.com. Give us a follow on Twitter, at rd1865. Subscribe to the podcast. Please share it with your friends and on social media if you're on there. And do leave us a review. It helps the Forest fans find it. Guy, thank you so much for coming Thank on. you. 